This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. We're still coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and around the world on the Starcom Radio Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, the Digital Broadcast Network as well as the Digital Satellite Network. If you'd like to listen to our show, 724-365, including the live feeds Monday through Friday from 8 p.m. until midnight, www.exoneradiotv.com. These are exciting days. You know, my wife and I took the opportunity today of sitting down and actually watching the, the Pope, Pope Francis, or as they're calling him, Papa Francisco. And I have to tell you something, Exo Nation. I was I was moved. I really was moved in a positive way today as we were sitting there and watching not only his um, his address to the United Nations, but what really moved us was when he was at the at the nine eleven site, and he was uh, there with other members of other denominations. And it was so, so, so positive, so good to see all the members of all these religious denominations there. And they're all talking about peace. They're all talking about love. They're, they're there. And the message was positive. And then when you had the kids towards the end singing, let there be peace on earth, like I've got to tell you something. It touched me. I really believe there is hope for this planet, that there is hope for this world. To see a pope go and work at a shelter, to see him talk to the leaders of the world, to see him talk to the joint session of Congress, to see the reaction of the people, you know that we still have a lot of good in this world. I've asked a good friend of ours to join us this hour, Dr. Don K. Preston, who is uh, well known to the members of the Exo Nation. Uh, first of all, Don, I want to thank you so much for coming on in such short notice. It's always a great pleasure having you with us. And um, what was your take on the Pope's visit so far? Well, to, to say the very least, it has been an interesting visit. Uh, I have been looking at it Particularly, Rob, because on my on my YouTube videos, uh, I have been addressing the folks who have been using the Pope's visit as quote proof positive mm -hmm. that we are in the last days, that the end is very near. Uh, I have been making videos in response to that, and uh, <laughs> needless to say. I have been being called uh, everything in the world except a nice person. Well, wait a so, second. That's because you don't hear what I say about you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the the feedback from that perspective, uh, I mean, people are claiming he's the 226th Pope. He's going to meet with President Obama on the 226th day, on and on and on. And I'm just telling people, look, this is unmitigated yeah. nonsense. Uh, there, there are already people out there who are saying – well, either Obama or the Pope will be shot in the head during this trip, mm -hmm. but they will be revived miraculously to prove that we're in the last days. And I'm just like, you know, Give Lord, how do you even how do you even argue with such nonsense? 
You know, but, I, I've heard the arguments that the Pope, when he addressed the United Nations, it was the dawning of the New World Order. And I watched that that uh, that uh, that speech this morning, and all I saw was the man who actually, in my humble opinion, and I'm no politician, Don, I just say what I believe, he brought for the first time in a very long time every country within the United Nations together for that time he was there. Well, th there is that to be said for his visit. Uh, now, I, I will be very candid. I have very little sympathy or empathy or agreement with the history of the Catholic Church. I yes, do I not do, agree yeah. with their theology no. at all. Uh, their, their past history and even their modern history in covering up uh, the sexual crimes of many of the priests is very, very sad and sordid. But you're right on that account. Uh, they, it is absolutely stunning to someone like me, Rob, who grew up very, very diametrically opposed to the Roman Catholic Church mm -hmm. uh, and to the pontiff, believing that the Roman Catholic Church was Babylon of Revelation, the Pope was the Antichrist, all yeah. of which I've rejected now through further study of the Scripture. But it, it truly is amazing to see the uh, to see how he inspires people mm -hmm. to to see how he causes people to uh, of every race. Yep, they have that thing in common. And when you saw him speaking, uh, was it yesterday or day before when the Speaker of the House uh, Boehner, who is an extremely devout. Catholic, who is known so. to be one of the most devout Catholics yeah. on all of Capitol Hill. Uh, and Newt Gingrich was commenting today, as a matter of fact, that said that uh, Mr. Boehner has long felt that the chief accomplishment of anything that he could accomplish would be to get the Pope to come to America and to address Congress. Well, there he was. He was addressing Congress. And there's Mr. Boehner boohoo bawling yep. like a baby yep. in, in the background. So the emotions that the visit of this pontiff have uh, have generated in, in the lives and the hearts of countless thousands of people just seeking to touch him. Now, to me, as a very devout Protestant, <laughs> I find a great... I find a great deal uh, objectionable about, about that kind of veneration. Yeah, so do I. And yet at the same time, you go, you know what? If we could get more and more and more people yep. united with one heart, one mind on the message of love, okay, on the message of let's reach out and help people. And let's face it. I may deplore the Pope's theology in many, many ways, but when he goes to a homeless shelter and he starts feeding people who are hungry and downtrodden, I, I want to tell you that that's a pretty powerful message. It sure is. It and sure when is. he drove, what, what kind of a car was he a driving, fiat. for crying out loud? A Fiat. A Fiat. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon me. Now, I don't know if that's an advertisement for the Italian car makers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> a I, very subtle message. I really don't. But I, I, I find a very powerful message mm -hmm. being sent that, well, on the one hand, he's accepting a certain degree of adulation. On the other hand, he is, in fact, telling people, I am a man. Yeah. And that's refreshing. What I really loved about him or I really love about him is that at the end of every speech or every appearance or even the mass that was held in in Madison Square Gardens and and, and Don I'm an Anglican you know so I can understand you know, I can't understand a lot but when he says to show that he is as common as you and I and everyone else pray for me and if you are not Able to pray, wish me well. Mm. Well, there are many, many things that he has done from the moment he stepped into office that have been so counter to the normal uh, pap papacy attitudes mm -hmm. uh, and and flavor. I'll just I'll just use the word flavor. 
and things like you're talking about right there. He really has exhibited himself to be the common man's pope. Yeah. Now, I, I've made comments on YouTube and Facebook. If he keeps taking some of the radical theological positions uh -huh. that he has taken since he became pope, he may become one of a handful of popes. And I think the last one, if memory serves me correctly, was Honorius uh, in the 6th century who was who was condemned as a heretic and banished from the Catholic Church uh, in in a controversy uh, that was known then, monothelitism, great big fancy Greek word, uh, having to do with whether or not he had both the human mind as well as the divine mind. And uh, monothelitism said he only had the mind of, of God. So Honorius, you know, took one side, and before it was all over, I mean, they, they just banned him and anathematized him. Well, here we've got this pope who is taking some positions on more on moral issues as well as theological positions that I can't help but feel that the conservative element of the bishops and the cardinals are in the private chambers just putting their head in their hands and going, oh, no, 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 this is not good. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, he lives in a small apartment, not in the papal residence. He is truly the Pope for the people. And I've got to be honest with you, Don, and, and with the Exo Nation. After watching him for the past number of days that, since he landed in the United States, I'm looking at him in a totally different light. Well, as, as I mentioned, the, the things that he is doing on that everyman level yeah. have such an appeal to them. And that's more than obvious. I mean, any I think you could safely say any time that a pope might come to America, yeah. they're going to draw crowds. Sure they will. Uh, just simply because uh, if you're raised as a Catholic or if you're indoctrinated as a Catholic, that is Christ's vicar on earth. That is God's representative, visible representative on earth, and you want to, you want to be there. Okay, yeah. I understand that. I disagree with it, but I understand that mentality. Because you respect it. Yeah, yeah, I, and so when you have people raised in that tradition, mm -hmm. and then you then you come along with a man that is reaching out to the membership of this Catholic Church on such a basic, fundamental, hey, I'm one of you. Uh, mm -hmm. I happen to be the Pope. Okay, that's great and fine, but look, I'm still a man. Uh, I need your help. I'm I'm so glad to be here with you and to reach out and touch you. That's remarkable. Another another light that has shone very brightly and I and I believe that this light has been tried to be suppressed is Speaker Boehner. I believe, you know, here he's the one who brought Netanyahu to the United States and he ate a lot of a lot of grief of for oh, that. Boy, did he ever. <laughs> you know? And, and when you see him, this is the third pope he's invited to the United States. This pope actually accepted the the um, the invitation. When you see what this man has tried to do by bringing Netanyahu to the United States and, and mending and bonding a relationship that I believe President Obama has tried to destroy. Bringing the been pope, pretty effective at yeah, doing. Yeah. And, and then bringing the pope here. I think that Speaker Bonner has done more for world peace than President Obama or a number of presidents before him. And yet, the very next day after Speaker Bonner accomplished his greatest accomplishment, what does he do? He resigns. It, it, it's, um, you know, there are some people that have been some political commentators, I'll put it that way, yeah. that I have been listening to over the last few days. And they're, they are granted of the, of the skeptical, dubious mindset. They have openly stated on some of the programs that I've been listening to and said, okay, there's something up here, something behind the scenes is going on because surely mm -hmm. Boehner would not resign immediately after the greatest accomplishment in his mind right. of, of his entire tenure. 
So there's got to be something going on. Well, I don't know that I'm that dubious or skeptical. I'm pretty skeptical about virtually all politicians, mind you. I don't trust very many politicians whatsoever. So uh, I'm going to reserve judgment in in that regard. Uh, I think what's so stunning, uh, and and this is a little bit of a shift from what you were saying there, Mm -hmm. Rob, but I do think it's absolutely stunning. President Obama has virtually ignored for how many years now, for all the years of his presidency, has virtually ignored the reality of the persecution of Christians around the world. Yes, he has. And when he has been almost begged to pay attention to what's going on in Palestine, in Russia, in China, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iran... He said virtually nothing about it, made virtually no efforts whatsoever to get uh, to get hostages out of Iran Mm -hmm. when he could have said to Iran, look, uh, if you don't give our four hostages back, you're not getting your 150 billion bucks. How simple would that have been? Very simple. And this is all part and parcel of the silence of President Obama in regard to Christian persecution. So now it took the Roman Catholic Pope coming to America for Obama to get up and to speak about Christian persecution around the world and how sad it was. And I listened to that speech, and I thought, that's about as half-hearted of a speech as I've ever heard in my life. There was no zeal. There was no compassion. There was no conviction. It, It was a political speech if I ever heard one in my life, mm-hmm. and it was given because the Pope is sitting there. I've got a theory on why Speaker Boehner left or resigned. Do you want to hear it? I certainly do. I think he's going to run for the presidency. I have heard speculation to that. It makes sense when you look at the timeline. Well, here's the problem that I see with that, Rob. He has alienated so many in the Republican Party. Right. uh, Because when the Republicans took control of both House and Senate, they vowed, and of course they ran on the platform of of challenging Obamacare, Mm -hmm. of repealing it. Right. Of, pardon me, of doing this, doing that, and, and really bringing to bear the conservative values of the Republican Party. Who thwarted those efforts? Boehner. He would he would stand up and talk a good show. When it came to a showdown, mm-hmm. he completely and totally re, uh, capitulated, tucked his tail, ran, and gave some of the flimsiest excuses that a person could possibly give. He has literally in, enraged the conservative element of the Republican Party. And on, on, and on at least two different uh, talk shows today, political talk shows, uh, a lot of discussion was being made about this very issue mm-hmm. that Boehner had alienated his own party. And so it makes me wonder, well, okay, is, is he thinking about running for president? president? If he is, if this was part of the strategy, Rob, then somehow, some way, he's going to have to find a way to reconcile himself <clears throat> with this very sizable element of the Republican Party, and that includes the national, uh, the president mm-hmm. of the National Republican Party itself, the leadership. He's going to have to find some way to do some reconciliation. I, I think it's been done for him already. I really do, I, and I think the two presidential debates for the GOP, for the Republican Party, have paid the way for him. For example, Donald Trump right now is leading with 26%, Fiorina, 16%, and Rubio with 9%. So you've, this is what America has to look forward to for their choices yeah. in presidential candidates for the Republican Party. All of a sudden, Boehner comes in. Whoa. He's got the experience. He was the number man three in the line of succession. He makes a lot of sense. 
And that's, if he that's would, an interesting postulate, I yeah. have to admit. My, again, my question would be, has he alienated the leadership of the Republican Party so much that they would not actually support him for well, the nomination? I, but, I, think, but. I think that Donald Trump, Fiorina, and Rubio have alienated them more <laughs> than Boehner ever could. Because Boehner well, has two, he's got, don't forget, he's got two accomplishments within the last year under his belt. That's very true. Number that's one, Netanyahu, true. which gives him all the Jewish votes. Number two, the Pope gives him all the Catholic popes, uh, all the Catholic votes. Bang. Well, you've raised some interesting points there that, that I haven't heard anyone else raise. So it will indeed be fascinating yeah. to see what unfolds it's a theory. after October when, when he is officially yeah. out of office, which still gives him plenty of time to jump in. Uh, it gives him time between now and then to mend some fences. Sure. And, and you know, those, those folks that were on these programs today with, uh, saying something else has got to be going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a simple resignation. There's something going yep. on. Uh, he may have been meeting behind closed doors already trying to mend those fences and pointing out the very things that you're pointing out. Guys, do we really honestly want to put Donald Trump up there as our candidate? Yeah, exactly. I mean, exactly. And, and Fiorina, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just sorry. I cannot support her. Nope. Uh, you know, I, uh, Trump and Fiorina just scare me to death. And I they, think Mar I think Marco Rubio is way too young. He doesn't have the experience. You know, I I I'm drawn to both him and Cruz oh, for Cruz, their yes. brilliance. Yes, Cruz. But yeah. What you, what you have said there is absolutely true. They are so young. Yeah. They they have no foreign exp uh, policy experience. They have no military experience. Yeah. Uh, you have to admire their upbringing. That you have to admire the fact that. Hey, uh, Rubio, his family story is, is incredible, mm -hmm. really is. It's the American dream. So there's no question about that, that he, he really does have that attraction. But I would really love for the man that I'm going to vote for, I would love for him to have some military experience, to, to, to have the wisdom yes. in, in the world that we're living in right now, to have the wisdom to listen to the military leaders Instead of being so anti-military, mm -hmm. like like Obama, as well as <clears throat> Mrs. Clinton, uh, both of them so are so anti-military that, uh, and, and it's well documented, how Obama has absolutely, completely, totally spurned the advice of the top military advisors who have told him, don't do this, don't do that. This is a huge mistake. That's a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. And he does not care. And he has cut the military, the size of the military, the awareness or the preparedness of the American military to its lowest point in literally decades. And uh, I, I read a report just the other day. America currently has only 450,000 troops that could go to war. And you think about China that has a standing army of well over a million. Mm -hmm. You think about North Korea that has a standing army of 400 to 500,000. You think about Iran, which has a standing army of several hundred thousand. I've forgotten the exact number. And instead of realizing that we are living in an extremely dangerous world, we have a president that says, well, I'm just going to cut back on our military. I'm going to cut back on the funding for military equipment. I'm going to cut back on the number of men that we have in the military because, after all, I don't want to be known as a war maker. Yeah. Well, that certainly uh, proved to be successful when it came to dealing with Syria a couple of years ago when he drew that line in the, uh, in the sand and... Yeah. You know, well, you, you, you don't it. understand, though, Rob. He drew oh. that with invisible ink. I gotcha. I keep forgetting that, Don, and you yes. keep pointing that out. To me. <laughs> Here, here's another. Here's another thing that I just thought of when it comes to uh, Speaker Boehner, if he was to run for the presidency of the Republican Party. You know how everybody is saying that Trump and Fiorino have have pushed away the Hispanic vote. Well, here you've mm -hmm. got a Speaker of the House who had the Pope 
brought to America, first of all, stopped off at Cuba, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. then into the United States. And what is it, Craig? A 90, 98.3% of all Hispanics are Catholics. Yes, yes, indeed. No well, question about there that. There you go. You know, if, if he was to run, I believe that he would win the election. Well, I'm going to say you've raised some points I have not considered thoroughly enough. I, I'm not, I'm not politically astute, I, and I freely admit that I'm, I'm a theologian, yep. and you know, I dedicate. I, I mean, I, I try not to be ignorant. You're politics. a man of God. Let's face it. Uh, so I try to, I try to know a little bit about what's going on, yep. I, and I certainly try to know the candidates, so that when I walk into that voting booth i'm not going well let me see do i have a coin in my pocket um, yeah. <laughs> you know i i just don't i don't want to do that i want to i want to vote for the person that i really honestly think is the best for that office well you know uh, you know how i but remember you, you've really raised some interesting and intriguing points well i'm glad i have because you know i, I just look at the situation as an outsider and i'm saying well okay what's going on here and then light goes on and say, wait a minute, I can see a pattern here. Maybe, maybe it's my old law enforcement career where you had to stand back and start putting the pieces of, of a puzzle together. I don't know. But when it comes to remembering who the the top three of the Republican Party are, I've come up with a very simple formula. Number one, you've got Trump. Number two, you've got Fiorina. Number three, you have Rubio, right? Mm-hmm. Larry, Mo, and Curly. <laughs> Yeah, uh, unfortunately, especially in the part of the first two, that's unfortunately absolutely accurate. Uh, you know, I, I mean, again, I'm not a politician, mm-hmm. but I've followed Trump and know, enough to know he has changed his tune. He's changed his positions with yeah. every wind that blows. The same with Fiorina. Uh, I, in fact, I've been doing some reading on Fiorina today. She She is a very eloquent woman. I, I love the fact that she has stood up and said, I will take on Mrs. Clinton right now, and if you want to see a cat fight, bring it on. All right. All <laughs> men love a cat fight. Eh? <laughs> so I really love that. But yeah. let's face it. She cut jobs uh, when, when she was in the corporate world. She slashed jobs. And not only did she slash jobs, she tripled her own salary at the expense of all of those people that lost their jobs. She, too, her background is more on the liberal side of the political spectrum than it is the conservative. So here she is, just like Trump, Mm -hmm. who has supported liberal causes heavily with lots and lots of money. And all of a sudden, he's claiming to be a conservative. Here is Fiorina, who has actually worked in political organizations, bashing conservatism, claiming now to be a conservative. Well, when she was running, wasn't she running for Senate and her opponent put together an ad that had all her failures in it and she lost the the race because of that? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Hey, I just thought of something, Don. You and I aren't supposed to be here. Exactly right, I, and I tell you what, I'm just I'm just so thrilled uh, <laughs> and so relieved. And, and you know, Rob, I've got to tell you this. What's that, my friend? When I began making the videos, mm-hmm. questioning and challenging and refuting Jonathan Kahn and his mystery of the Shemitah, posting my videos on YouTube. And folks, if you want to go to YouTube, just look up Don K. Preston Morning Musings. And the Shemitah is false or exposing the Shemitah, et cetera, et cetera. You can find me on YouTube very very easily enough. Anyway, <clears throat> when I began doing that, Rob, hundreds and hundreds of people began attacking me for questioning Jonathan Kahn. Why? People, people tell me he's a prophet of God. He knows what he's talking about. This man received this revelation directly from God. I responded kindly but forcefully, saying he's not a prophet. And pointing out such minor little details like this, Rob, here is Jonathan Kahn, uh, a a Hebrew rabbi, who admits that Torah, that is the law of Moses, was never given to America. Never given to America. So, so you mean we? So you mean we've got to take out the Book of Exodus as well as the Book of Genesis in the Bible because it wasn't given to us? 
oh, we can definitely learn from it. But here, the, here is my point. Mm-hmm. Here is a man taking the law of Moses concerning yeah. Shemitah, which is, you know, the law of the Sabbaths, all right? Right. And the seventh year Sabbath. And that, that observance of that seventh year Sabbath and the 49th or 50th year Sabbath, those were divine mandates given strictly to Israel. Jonathan Kahn admitted that. But what does he do? He admits that law of the Sabbath years, the Sabbath months, were never given to America. But America is going to be punished because we haven't observed the Shemitah law. Now, wait a minute. It's kind of like you and I on the last program, Rob. Uh, could could you arrest an American for not observing Canadian law? Only if he broke Canadian law, yes. Exactly right. Exactly right. Uh, if he's in Canada and broke Canada's law, sure, you can arrest him. Yeah. But could you come into America and find a guy walking down the street and know that, uh, you know, just – you see him doing something distinctly, distinctively Canadian, okay? Mm-hmm. Distinctive, distinctively in violation of some particular and exclusive Canadian law. Could you come into America and arrest him for that? Is this person also breaking an American law? No. No, you can't. Exactly right. And yet that's exactly what Jonathan Kahn said has been going on. America's not under Shemitah. The Shemitah laws were never given to America, and yet here is America who has not observed Shemitah. Well, because we're not under it, but because we haven't observed it, guess what? God's going to punish us. I mean, it's just, it's such ridiculous stuff. So anyway, that's the kind of post and videos that I begin to point out. And by the way, in, in my video number 10, and I actually discovered this. I had I had encountered this in my studies years ago, but for some some reason I didn't connect the dots this time, Rob. And you know how sometimes it takes us a while to connect the dots. Sure. And I was reading an article online the other day of a guy who had connected the dots. Well, here's here's the, here are the two dots. There is a a known historical calendar. And what is relevant about this calendar is that it chronicles the kings of Persia. Okay. Right. Well, then there is a Hebraic calendar. And this Hebraic calendar is known, acknowledged. It is undeniably at variance with the historical valid calendar in a variation of 250 seven years. Wow. So this is not just a really little minor miscalculation. I mean, you know, we've got the Gregorian uh, calendar, we got the Roman calendar, and we got a variance there in, in those calendars of, what is it, two to three years, depending upon which one you look at. Okay. So here, here's the Hebraic calendar that is at variance by 257 years over what is known by historians, okay, documented by historians. To be true, the Hebraic calendar is wrong. The Hebrew calendar does not count all of the known, all of the documented Persian kings. The Hebrew calendar only lists four Persian kings. But hey, Every good historian, and I'm I'm not a historian of the Persian kings, but I know, <coughs> pardon me, I know where to find the list. Okay, so here's the Hebrew calendar only lists four kings. The <coughs> the Persian calendar and the Persian chronicles list a whole bunch of kings, and there's a discrepancy of 257 years. Now, here's what I want the audience to listen to very carefully, Rob. If one accepts The Hebrew calendar, which is what was used by Jonathan Kahn, that Hebrew calendar eliminates the Old Testament prophecies, such as Daniel chapter 9, from being a messianic prophecy of Jesus, the Messiah. Now, I hope the audience catches the power of that statement. 
Here is Jonathan Kahn, who claims to be a believer in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Yet, in order to get his calculations for the Shemitah of September the 15th, September the 23rd, and to scare the bejesus out of everyone into thinking the world was going to end, America's economic system was going to collapse, what did he do? He used a calendar that he actually admitted on the David Reagan TV program, which is, if I'm not mistaken, out of Texas. But he admitted on the program that if you accept that Hebrew calendar, it eliminates Jesus from being Messiah. Huh. And yet here are all of these so-called Christians buying into Jonathan Kahn's supposedly divinely revealed revelations from God about the Shemitah, saying he's a prophet of God. And by the way, in his book, The Mystery of the Shemitah, he said, I didn't have any plans to write a book. I didn't have any plans to talk about all this stuff and write about all this stuff. But he said the revelations came directly from above. They came directly from heaven. Well, if that's not claiming to be a prophet, I don't know what it is. Answer me. Answer me one thing, Don. Why doesn't he have people refer him, refer to him as as rabbi? That's a really good question. And in in all objectivity and honesty, on some programs he is referred to as rabbi. Oh, okay. I, I've seen some programs refer to him that. But I, I'll tell you what: a, an annoying number of programs refer to him as. God's last days prophet. Well, we 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 sent an invitation to uh, to um, Jonathan Kahn, and when we get him on the show, which we will, I am going to see if I can get him to come on and debate you on air. Oh my goodness gracious, this would be awesome. We've already <laughs> we've already got the wheels in motion, and we're looking at a two hour debate. Well. As John Fogarty said in song some years ago, put me in, coach. I'm ready. Uh, I know you're ready. I know you are ready, my friend. Let's get the other uh, the other team on uh, the field, and we, we're going to make this happen. Oh, that would be absolutely awesome. It would be wonderful, and I think people would learn an awful lot about this situation. Oh, by the way, yeah. in case you didn't know, uh, Jonathan Kahn has already given one presentation saying, look, folks, I never set a date. And that's a bald-faced misrepresentation. Well, yeah, because there's a whole bunch of listings uh, in news articles that are published online where dates are given. In, in one of his videos, I have posted a link to it on YouTube repeatedly. Yeah. When, when people have said Jonathan Kahn never predicted the time, one of his videos entitled John, uh, Jonathan Kahn 2015, Rapture 2015, the lead-in to that video <clears throat> says, what if you could be shown that Jonathan Kahn has discovered a mystery, a revelation from God that is so precise that it predicts not only the year but the month the day and the hour when these things would take place. Now, if that's not setting a date, I don't know how much more precise you could get. And yet, <clears throat> again, he's already been on TV saying, mm -hmm. the entire time I've been warning people I'm not setting dates. Then why did you talk about the 13th? Why did you talk about the 23rd? Or it wasn't the 15th, excuse me. Why did you talk about these dates? These dates? <clears throat> Why did you say that the revelation is from God? <coughs> Why did you say, <coughs> pardon me, all of the other occurrences of the Shemitah were so precisely on the dates of the Shemitah? If you did not intend for us to think of a precise date. Don, what we're going to do here is we're going to let you get a let you get a glass of water, my friend. We're going to be, we're going to take a couple of commercials. We'll be right back. Don, get a glass of Thank water, you. my friend. Exonation, the one and only Dr. Don K. Preston is our special guest to this hour. His website is bibleprophecy.com. 
And as I said, we have extended an invitation to Rabbi Jonathan Kahn to come on to the show, and we want to arrange a debate between Dr. Don K. Preston and Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. It'll take a couple of days, a couple of weeks, but we will get it going, and it'll be a two-hour debate. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We'll be back with Don K. Preston after this short break. Don't go away. Jesus came back now and insisted that we listen to him. How would the world be different if Christians really followed the Gospels? For 2,000 years, we've been practicing a religion. Now it's finally time to get it right. Read Liberating Jesus, new from Roberta Grimes. Meet the Jesus you never knew. Roberta uses afterlife evidence and biblical analysis to prove that Jesus is exactly right. Learning the lessons that he came to teach is the reason we are born at all. Roberta says he has come back now to insist that we actually listen to him so we can begin to use his teachings to unite and transform the world. Liberating Jesus on Amazon, October 1st, and then wherever books are sold. Jesus has the answers, and it's not too late. Roberta blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State-certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Dr. Don K. Preston is our guest this hour, ExoNation, www.bibleprophecy.com. Um, yeah, all these different end-of-the-world prophecies that you and I have discussed since I've had the pleasure of having you on the show, Don, uh, Harold Camping, um, we talked about the 2012 Mayan calendar. Uh, who was the other guy we talked about? Well, we've we've talked about an awful lot of <laughs> yeah we have we have an, <coughs> pardon an, me we we talked about Edgar Edgar Wizenot with right. eighty eight reasons why the rapture would be in nineteen eighty eight I have uh, briefly mentioned the fact that uh, Jack Van Eppy said the Lord was coming in nineteen ninety nine John Hagee of course with the blood moons yeah which by the way it's by the blood way, moon tonight uh blood no it's actually tomorrow night Who is it tomorrow night. I yeah, blood, blood Moon is actually yeah. tomorrow night, and earth-shattering events are supposed to take place. And um, <clears throat> so I think that's why we actually said we'd come back on October the 1st yeah. and, and celebrate all of us still being here. And uh, <clears throat> John Hagee is still on record now mm -hmm. as saying something remarkable, some, something earth-shattering is about to take place. Uh, I suspect that he already has his retraction. And his excuse speech already drafted, however. It's funny because I just checked our broadcast schedule and we have you on our broadcast schedule for, let me see, Thursday, October the 1st from 10 p.m. until 11 p.m. There you go. Yeah. I suspect we'll be here, Rob. Uh, <laughs> I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. In fact, you know, you know what? Uh, Lord, I, I think something Lord fantastic. Willing, nothing happens, you know. I mean, uh, uh, something can always happen. In I the think it already world. has. I really think it already has. And what they thought, they were right. It was the end of the world as we know it. I think what has happened 
is that we have seen a shift from negativity to a positive re- revival. And I think that thanks to Speaker Bonner, Boner, how do you pronounce his name anyway? Is it Boner? I, I think Ma- it's Boner. Okay. Uh, the Speaker. Yeah, <laughs> you know, bringing bringing the Pope to America and and what the Pope has been able to do, I think there's been a the end of the world of negativity, and we're going to start seeing a positive swing. Well, you know, I, I was I was starting to relate something to you that uh, as I began to make my videos uh, addressing Jonathan Kahn's false claims, right. I was attacked relentlessly. <clears throat> I mean, people calling me uh, hateful, ugly. Et cetera, et cetera. How can you be? How can they call you hateful? Because I dared to challenge God's prophet. But, but you didn't. You didn't challenge God's prophet. You were challenging uh, somebody who was making ridiculous claims. That's right. But in their world, in in their mentality, I did not have a right to question. When I pointed out to them that the Bible says prove all things, hold fast that which is good. When the Bible says, test the prophets to see whether they are of God, it meant nothing. In fact, Mm -hmm. out of the hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of uh, private messages that I received attacking me, not one single person offered one single verse, not one of them, to answer what I was saying. But here's the remarkable thing that's happened. I have had some people who were adamant in their rejection of the evidence that I was presenting. And I I did my very best, very, very best to answer with kindness and with patience because, I mean, look, I've been so dead wrong in my own life and in my own theology in the past, and I never know where somebody else is at in their own spiritual journey. If I believe that God was patient with me in my ignorance and in, even in my arrogance at times in, in times past, then guess what? I believe that I ought to extend some grace to other people wherever they're at in their spiritual journey, mm-hmm. even though I may vehemently disagree with them. And, and there certainly comes a time and a place for strong language perhaps. But as I tried to just simply reason with the people that were objecting to what I had to say, all of a sudden now, the attacks have stopped, Rob. I've had people now private messaging me saying, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for the evidence that you presented. Mm-hmm. So a shift in that has has taken place. And here we are two days past the deadline. Yep. And I didn't get on and I didn't gloat. I didn't say, ha, oh, yo, nanny, nanny, boo, boo. <laughs> none, nanny, none of that. Nanny, boo, boo? Yeah, well, you know, it's a saying here in America when, you, when, you've, uh, when you've been proven oh, right I see. Okay. and vindicated. Nanny, nanny, uh, nanny, I don't boo, even boo. know where the statement came from. <laughs> I don't even know where the, the little saying came from. But my kids used to say it once in a while. It's nanny, nanny, boo, boo. So whatever it is. <laughs> Maybe that's an Oklahoma thing, Rob. I don't I know. I like it. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we need to do some research and find out where that came from. Okay. Yeah. But be that as it may, um, I certainly haven't indulged <coughs> in any of that. And there has been a decided and a marked shift mm-hmm. in the tenor of people posting now on my videos. And it's quite remarkable. What is the significant? Well, you know, like what's the significance of the of the red moon again? Well, here is what John Hagee has said. He uh, he has gone back through history and it is chronicled mm-hmm. through astronomy when this tetrad, as it is called, which is a <coughs> I, pardon me for my problem. I'm sure, no problem, Don. Take care of yourself, buddy. Uh, I used my respirator there when I stepped away, and it hasn't taken effect yet. But be that as it may, and he's he's shown how historically there has been some rather remarkable things happen on some given occasions of the tetrad. Well, what he uh, what he very conveniently pointed out, there have been some tetrads in the past when absolutely nothing remarkable has happened. But the main problem that I have with John Hagee is that he goes 
to Joel chapter 2, 28 and following, which said, It shall come to pass in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And let me skip over a little bit uh, because of the time's sake here. And the moon shall be turned to blood. The sun shall be darkened, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, ah, see, the moon will be turned to blood. That's the, that's the astronomic phenomena of the tetrad. Well, no, it's not. As a matter of fact, what it almost undoubtedly refers to is a time of war, because the rest of the text says, I shall show blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Those are images of warfare. Yes. And so he is taking Hebraic images of, of a time of war and applying them to an astro- <coughs> pardon me, to an astronomical astronomical phenomenon. But here's another major problem. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, which was 2,000 years ago, he and the apostles had just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right. The people in that audience that day said, well, me, you know, these guys are just drunk out of their mind. They're just stammering and stuttering. And yet at the same time, they were going, wait a minute, guys. We're here to speak in our, lo- in our language of, from wherever we're back. You know, Mesopotamia and Parthia and Medes and in the Elamites and we're hearing them speak in our tongues, and yet they're nothing but Galileans. Well, Peter stands up and says, men of Israel, hear my words. These men are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day, and in the ancient culture of the time, I'm telling you, it was just anathema to drink before the third hour of the day, nine o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> so here's Peter saying, no, brethren, I'm telling you, these men are not drunk, Seeing it's about the third hour of the day. Right. But then notice what he says. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I will pour up my spirit upon all flesh. So here is Peter informing them <clears throat> that day that they were living in the last days. Well, that means the last days were 2,000 years ago. So when John Hagee stands up and says, we're in the last days, I'm sorry, he's too late. Because the last days is not a statement that extends for 2,000 years. As a matter of fact, in my book, which is entitled, The Last Days Identified, you can find it on my website, BibleProphecy.com. And by the way, Rob, let me offer a special offer here, if I may. Sure. Uh if anyone will order the book, The Last Days Identified, make mention of the fact that you heard my mention on the X-Zone radio. I'll pay the shipping. Uh, now, I can't do that to everyone in Canada, unfortunately, but I will knock $5 off of the shipping. Wow. And because normal shipping is four ninety five, But if you live in Canada, I'll knock $5 off, off of shipping. So, <clears throat> or anywhere else that you are out of the continental United States. But here's the point. <clears throat> that term last days Don, we're going to really have to make it fast I've got less than 30 seconds right last days refers to the last generation of the old covenant age of Israel that ended in AD 70 it's proven in my book Don, I want to thank you so much for joining us take care of your cough my friend I look forward to Thanks, the next bro. time you join us here always a great pleasure being with you my friend and until then God bless Exonation, uh, Dr. Don K. Preston, www.bibleprophecy.com. I'll be back on the other side of this news break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. <laughs> 